column. And then they also get a certificate of completion that'll have all the course information on it. Okay, so we do have Lucy is here. Lucy, how are you today? Can you hear us? Oh, hi, yep, I'm doing well, thank you. Wonderful, we're just hi. talking to all the people that are on the line right now. Where are you from? Los Angeles. Oh, wonderful. Cool. Well, we're glad you're here today and we're gonna get yeah. started in just a minute. Do you have any expectations or thoughts about the webinar? A couple of people are expressing they questions about rugs or upholstery. Do you have anything that you, any particular questions before we get into yeah. it? Yeah. I mean, I'm so interested because viscose has such a bad reputation and yet so many fabrics that are beautiful or rugs have viscose in it. I've been avoiding it like the plague just based on horror stories other designers have told me. So I'm just curious what you guys are going to say. Yep. Okay. Now it's a common problem, common complaint. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, we will definitely keep that in mind. And we have a couple other people here from Los Angeles, but I'm going to mute you. But if cool. you have questions, just put in the chat or the Q&A and um, we'll address them appropriately as Tony's conducting the course. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, it's 3.30. Why don't we um, give it five? Give it a couple more minutes. It's happy hour, Larry. Cheers. It's happy hour. Cheers, everybody. Wonderful. Tony's drinking out right out of the bottle. <laughs> don't you? Yeah. Tony's in a storm in Boston. They're having quite a, quite a crazy situation there, which yeah. is. 60 know. mile an hour winds, but you know, wait 15 minutes, it can change. Yeah, well, it's New England weather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, okay, we had a couple other people come on. Let me unmute them. We have Stacy and Ryan and Brandon here. If folks can hear us, are you there? They're not saying anything. Many times people don't. We got lucky. Lucy was engaged with us, <laughs> which was cool. Um, so anyway, why don't we see where these other people are from? They're not saying it. I'm kind of waiting. Brandon came in. Brandon, are you there? I muted him. Well, we'll see. If, again, if any of you folks that just came in, you'll see there's a Q&A button and there's a chat bot button at the bottom. You can click on those below and please send us any questions as we're going along. And we'll introduce ourselves in just a minute and we'll be able to go over any questions that you might have at the end. And we're also gonna be giving away $500 worth of protection to one of you folks that have showed up today. And um, Tony's gonna to be going over that and Eric as well, as well at the end of production, so at the presentation. So stay till the end so you can get that as well. And uh, we're gonna have some great information today. Yeah. Very yeah. engaged, we got a lot of history here. Tony's been doing this for a long time and um, it makes a big difference. You learn a couple of details, can go a long way, especially with problem fibers, like Lucy was saying. Cheers for are all you, you folks uh, that just came in. Are you calling me old, Larry? Yes. You're as old as me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're all the same age. <laughs> so you can be as old, you can be old if you want. I choose not to be. There you go. <laughs> well, Larry, let's fire it up. Okay. So what I'm going to do, oh, Mariah just came in and I'll give her just a moment. And after Mariah. How's it going today, Mariah? Okay, I unmuted her so she can say anything if she wants. If you come in, if you have any questions, please go down to the Q&A or the chat. I think she's muted, Larry. I see, I see the uh, little X through the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Well, if she wants, and she can hear us. Um, if you wanna have any questions, go to the Q&A or the chat, let us know. And uh, well, let's get engaged. So in the meantime, folks, cheers. We're gonna have a nice presentation here and I'm gonna hand over the reins to Mr. Eric Sprague and he's gonna hand over the reins after that to Mr. Tony Miklaszewski and we're very happy to have both of these guys with us, experts in their own right. 
and we're going to go over their background and everything and mine as well. So Eric, why don't you have the floor here and take over for me. All right. Well, thank you, Larry. Appreciate you getting everything started. Welcome to everybody who came to the virtual happy hour. Thank you for taking the time for coming on. Uh, what we're going to talk about is, is difficult fibers. You know, Lucy had come on and said that she wants to talk about viscose, and we're going to talk a lot about viscose because a lot of people are not wanting to use it, not wanting to sell it, not wanting to recommend it because it's such a problematic fiber, and there's lots of fibers like that. So before we get to that, I'd like to talk a little bit about our company and the three of us here on, on the show. So Tony, if you could move to the next screen, I'd appreciate that. So as you can see, you've got myself, Eric, with Larry and, and, and Anthony, we call him Tony. And we're three old friends from the cleaning industry. We've been friends for quite a long time and we've had our separate businesses and we have decided to all pitch together to uh, really get involved with this Lux fabric protection that we're gonna talk about a little bit after the class today and, and how that's used. But, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Larry and I, because we have a very long history. Tony, if you maybe go to the next slide, that'd be great. So there's Larry and I when we were younger. <laughs> and uh, Larry and I have been in the cleaning industry for a really long time. We did cleaning and we also did water damage restoration all through California, uh, Southern California. And we had that business for a very long time. And in 2018, we we sold it. We sold it to a a competitor and Larry and I went off and said, you know, it's time for, we've done our building and it's time for us to go and uh, decide what we're going to do next. Um, the IICRC is our governing body in the cleaning industry. Larry and I had a IIC certified firm for I, IICRC certified firm for many years. And uh, now we are partnering with Tony in California to bring his Lux fabric protection out to all the designers and furniture stores and rug stores and all that. But we bring, uh, you know, better part of a decade and a half of experience to this game. So uh, that's a little bit about Larry and I. Larry and I were college roommates in New Hampshire. So Larry and I have been doing this kind of some sort of business partnership since we were 18 years old. And yeah, it's been I'm not going to tell you how old we are, but it's, it's, it's been a long time. <laughs> so. Anyway, Tony, maybe you want to go to the next screen. I can tell everybody a little bit about you. Uh, we have Tony Miklaszewski here. Tony lives in Boston. He's also an IICRC certified master restorer and cleaner. And, you know, Tony was a lot like Larry and I. He had a pretty big water damage restoration business. And in the businesses, you get a lot of high-end rugs, high-end furniture, draperies that are being ruined in these floods when sprinkler systems go off or toilets overflow. So we have to learn how to correct those and then also get them into back into working order so they can go back in the house. And then through that, Tony really got really into high-end textiles and to the point where he has now invented a product to help protect these troublesome uh, fibers that we all encounter on a daily basis. So Tony is truly the expert here. He's going to be running today's class. Um, he's certified to run these classes and, um, and I can't wait to, to tell you a little bit more, more about Tony once we get going. But uh, first we have a couple of sponsors that I'd like to talk about for, for the webinar. We have Ambassador LLC. They are in the greater Boston area. Uh, you can see a picture of Wayne. Wayne's a 22 year old I mean, 22 years in the British military as a paratrooper. He's got like 3,200 uh, jumps out of airplanes. And he runs an amazing white glove moving service for high-end goods. And yes, they're in the greater Boston area, but they service the entire United States. So if somebody's moving from New York or Boston to LA or San Francisco, these are the guys that can do it. So uh, they're really good. Wayne's very systematic. He brings that military precision to moving and they do a phenomenal job. And then we also have Designer Advantage. And Designer Advantage is really a company that meets the back end needs for designers. I mean, most designers aren't in love with doing the back end part of their business. They want to design their often artists at, at heart and what Mark and his team bring is accounting, purchasing, logistics, and they have a really cool new product uh, where it's putting it all on, online so that everybody can do it. So uh, 
big kudos to designer advantage. They, they, they really do an amazing job for designers. And Tony, I think it's time for me to pass the baton to you so that everybody can get what they really want. They don't want to hear me talking. They want to hear about fabrics. Thank so, you. You're welcome. Appreciate that introduction. And uh, Larry is wild as he usually is. Um, <laughs> Always. I will. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's get started. I'm going to try to make it a little bit on the short side because I know there's going to be a lot of questions later about um, fabric care, especially the viscose and the tensile. Uh, so this here is a approved course um, for AIA, ASID, IDC, and I have to show the screen, you get one CEU value. Uh, if you need the credit, if you would please email us that you need it um, along with your name, your um, IDEC number, and then which organization uh, you need it for. Uh, and then if it's uh, AIA, I believe that's self-reporting. So we can get you the information, just email us and let us know. So let's get right into it. Um, Want to go over the types of fibers first, just so we understand. And there used to be just three categories of fibers, and now we're talking about a fourth one. Um, and we'll get into it. That's going to be the semi-synthetic fiber. But the first one are the natural fibers. And you have the cellulose fibers, which is cotton. You're used to seeing that. It's the white or brownish, uh, can be dyed very easily. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, then you also have linen is in that natural fiber. It's more plant-based. Um, it's still, a, these are great fibers. They're mixed in almost everything. A lot of the high-end goods will have some type of linen or cotton um, in there. Uh, the protein fibers, uh, these are some of the favorite. Um, I mean, the wool fibers, I mean, you have Apaca, Mohair, Angora, uh, just tons of different ones. Uh, I actually did a chart on them, and I think I have like 17 different types of wools, uh, animals that they, um, they use. Uh, I even seen a musk ox. It's, the, um, it's called quivet, and the quivet is the innermost hair of the musk, and it goes for about $35 an ounce, and it's a uh, quivet. It's um, very rare. I don't see much of it, but uh, it's, that stuff's out there. And then the silk from the... Mulberry um, silkworm, and they're, it's using the cocoon. Um, it's sought after because it's, it can be dyed in very, very brilliant colors. Uh, what's cool and amazing on this is you see a picture of the cocoon up there. I mean, this is soaked into a fluid, and then people sit there and they untangle it and pull it out into to strands. Um, I know I wouldn't have the patience for that, but uh, they do it, and that's why you pay the top dollar for it. Um, and then here's a sea silk. Sea silk is actually, it's the filament that attaches the clam to the bottom of the ocean. And this is, uh, so it secures the shell to the seafloor. And it's, this is the most rarest fiber out there. Um, it's not even really traded publicly anymore. The last public um, piece that was sold was back in 1767. Uh, so that's there's only about 60 known pieces left that are made of it, but it's, it's pretty interesting that it's a, a category of protein fiber I never even knew about until about five years ago when I started doing these classes. Uh, this is the new class. This is the really interesting one. This is the uh, semi-synthetics. This is going to be your viscose. Your, um, oh, so we'll start off with acetate. Um, acetate's been around for a long time. Uh, it's, you're going to see it still in a lot of stuff. Uh, the rayon, the rayon is uh, something you've seen for years, but what a lot of people don't realize is rayon is just rayon viscose. Uh, the government made us start calling it vis rayon viscose. Uh, so it's been out there. People are afraid of viscose, but how often have you had clothes made of rayon or, or rayon fibers in it? So it's just the it's just the weave of the new viscose that, that makes people worried. Uh, other names for viscose, art silk. Um, it's interesting, it makes it sound so well. It, it just means artificial silk. Um, bamboo silk, uh, you'll see banana silk. Um, I saw one the other day on the back of a rug, it said um, eucalyptus silk. So it's just made of the eucalyptus plant and it's mixed with a chemical. Uh, made into a slurry and then extruded into a fiber. And there you have it. That's the rayon viscose. 
Um, now with rayon viscose, you actually don't collect any of the wastewater or chemical. Unlike lyocell or tensile, I haven't seen it much in fabrics yet, but it's a lot of rugs out there. Uh, that recovers about 98%, 95 to 98% of the chemical. So it's better for the environment. Uh, so on to those semi-synthetics. We're going to talk, I want to save a lot of that for afterwards because you're going to have cleaning issues. Um, you know, how durable is it? So we'll save that for the questions afterwards because we need to talk about specific cleaners and products and we're not really supposed to name any products within the class. So then we have the, um, the last category is going to be synthetic fibers. Now the um, they're all man-made, and the number one that we see everywhere is nylon. Uh, you even see it in uh, fabric. It's going to be called polyamide is when you see it. So it's a, that's one that kind of tricky. People see that. They're not sure what it is. It's basically nylon. Uh, mostly it's in about 65% of the uh, carpets, wall-to-wall -wall carpet that's out there, the broad loom. Um, we see a little bit of it in the high-end uh, market. Um, acrylic. Acrylic's been around since the 1940s, very durable. It's dyed, what's nice about it, it's dyed all the way through to the center of the, of the fiber. So it, it doesn't really bleach out as much. It doesn't ugly out as much. And the name that you're probably used to is Sombrella just made it popular again. Sombrella did a great job on rebranding the acrylic name. Um, it's not a bulletproof vest. You still have to clean it. You still should do some fabric enhancements to it. Uh, it still gets dirty. A lot of people I notice will be like, well, I bought Sombrella. Why is it getting dirty? It, it still gets dirty. Uh, it's going to. So we just, we have to learn how to clean it properly. Uh, good old polyester, um, you know, all the way from back in the leisure suit days. Um, you know, and it's still used today. Uh, it just has some tendencies of, uh, it can show wear faster than other fabric, especially faster than nylon and definitely faster than, you know, the naturals like wool and silk. Uh, olefin or polypropylene, it's another synthetic fiber. We don't see it too much in the high-end uh, market. It, this is interesting. You can actually pour bleach on olefin and it won't stain it but it does wear very fast and oil loves it. Uh, it's made with a little bit of um, like a diesel fuel in it. So if you put that near a kitchen or, um, or even um, uh, in an entryway near a, a blacktop driveway, the oil from the blacktop will get onto that olefin and lock on pretty hard, pretty quickly. Um, now, another factor in cleaning is gonna be the construction. Uh, the construction really means a lot. For example, a woven fabric with these patterns, the way they're woven and weaved, it gives it more area for the soil to get trapped into, especially that plain weave. I, I'm, I can see through it. So if you spill something that may be more on a, on a food, like a sauce, it's, it's going to get all the way through into the backing. Uh, it's a little bit harder to clean for the your client to clean it up, uh, not a professional, but you know we're talking about both how a professional is going to clean and a client later, because you don't want the client trying to clean one of your designs and then creating a little bit of damage. Uh, twill weave, a little bit tighter. Satin weave, we see a lot of this, uh, even tighter. It's a lot easier to to clean up and spot clean, but all these have a factor on cleaning. It's gonna be easier to spot clean a twill or a satin than it is a woven. Uh, pile weaves, um, this is where we see a lot of issues when you're having, you've probably had some furniture delivered, it shows up at a receiving warehouse, they unwrap it, and then it unfortunately has crushing. And you know, the people start panicking. Well, the crushing can be groomed out. It can even be groomed out of viscose uh, so you don't notice it anymore. Uh, so this is one of the hardest ones to keep looking fresh. Um, you use grooming brushes and you can even have the client, you can have their cleaning staff having a grooming brush and they can help, you know, take care of it. It's part of the maintenance that they'll do when they vacuum it and they just, they groom it. Uh, but I wouldn't stay away from pile weaves even pile weaves with viscose in it. So we'll go over those at the end. Uh, and then the jacquard weaves. These are the ones that I actually find are the toughest 
to clean because a jacquard weave, the way it is made is if you look at the picture down in the very bottom, the, it looks like a photo negative on the back. And the reason why it does that is underneath that red is every other color that's in that pattern. And if someone leaves it too wet, it's going to bleed right to the, right to the surface. So you got to make sure you have a qualified cleaner and you can clean it up. Uh, spills would, could actually make it bleed too, depending what you're, you're spilling on it. A um, couple of other things that we wanted to show just thought was interesting. Uh, flocking. Uh, the flocking is bigger in Europe than it is here. It's actually a, a powdered wool and it's actually sprayed onto a cloth that has a, an adhesive on it. And it's, it's supposed to look like a velvet. And the problem with that is it's glued on now. And if someone does a spot cleaning with a solvent-based chemical, they could take that adhesive off and next thing you know is you have a bare spot uh, on it. So um, flocking is a little tough if people are going to try to sp spot clean themselves, but it is out there and it's usually in the very, very high end, um, high end market from the uh, mostly, I believe it's a Britain in Britain, but uh, it isn't through, throughout Europe. Uh, there's a little picture of it. Uh, knitting, knitting is another, uh, could be a problem area because it's even thicker now and it can hold more moisture. And there could be, if it's multiple strands, if there's some wool, uh, some say nylon in it, and, and they have different stretch and shrink rates when it gets wet. The, the nylon's not gonna shrink at all and the wool may shrink a little bit and um, it can start creating some wrinkles. So these are things you have to look at the different types of fibers that are within the fabric that you're purchasing. Uh, tufting, we don't see much of it, but um, more in, in smaller rugs and rugs. And the, the tufting uh, makes another problem because you actually have to concern with the knots down in the base and what the backing is. So say these, say it's tufted around a jute. Well, if you spill water on that, the jute may bleed. And then as it dries, remember everything has to dry and wick to the top right off the face. And you're gonna pull up some uh, jute stains. You're gonna look like brown stains or even red stains. And now here we get into the, um, the meat of it. It's basically caring for the fabric. Um, if, if someone, if you find a, a nice sofa for someone and then all of a sudden a year later they're complaining that it's, you know, it's not holding up, it's not looking well. And that could be because of the, mostly because of the maintenance of the product. How do they take care of it? Um, one, yes, you do have to choose the right fabric, but a lot of these fabrics are very durable, plenty of rubs, uh, so they're gonna last. Um, but an additional thing you can do is you can put an enhancement on the fabric. Um, helps enhance against stains. It could be sun fade if it's gonna be in a, in a sunny area. Um, we have some that last, uh, make it last longer. It'll slow down the wear. Um, I read a test that was done where 700,000 people walked over a university hallway carpet uh, that was, um, it actually was a, a nylon carpet and part was treated with a enhancement for against stain and wear and the another half wasn't. And after 700,000 people walking over it for two years, the part that wasn't treated needed to be cleaned um, 64 times total. The part that was uh, treated only had to be eight. And then the section that was cleaned and retreated after each one was only cleaned four times. So you're talking about it's helping the fabric last longer it's keeping it clean longer, less downtime, uh, saves cost of cleaning and saves water for the environment. Um, and then the last enhancement, which in this pandemic time uh, is one that can help stop the spread of unwanted bacteria. So there's many en enhancements out there. Um, there used to be even ones that would help stop uh, static electricity. Now that's kind of mostly built into all of them. But if, even if you have one that it's broken down and someone's like, yeah, every time I walk across the floor and I get on my sofa, I get an electrical shock. Uh, there's actually an enhancement to take care of that. And then the other parts of the uh, fabric care that's very important is um, things that the client or the client staff can do. Um, 
you know, turn your cushions to reduce wear. If it's a three seat sofa, and let's say all three seats are the same, if they're cleaner, rotate them every month. Don't forget each cushion has two sides. So by the time the corner seat gets used on the same side, that seven months have gone by. So you really can stretch out you know, the length of time that the, this furniture can last. And people don't realize that they leave the same cushion there. You know, the husband's always sitting in the same spot and then they're complaining after a year, it looks worn out. Well, if he only sat on that cushion four, time, four months out of a year, it's gonna last a lot longer. You know, it's gonna last at least three or four times longer. Uh, vacuuming, vacuuming is very important. Uh, removes up to 95% of the soil and that's what does the damage. So if you if you can get them to vacuum, uh, the staff to vacuum the sofa, it's gonna keep it cleaner longer and then you don't need a, a cleaning company to come out and clean it. You know, they're pretty much only, only gonna have to come out and remove the oily soils, the ones that, that can't be removed with dry soil removal. Um, brushing especially on velvets, but on any of them, you can uh, get horsehair brushes or a velvet brush, and it's good to groom your sofa and, and it helps remove any of the dry soil that's just adhered to it just slightly. Um, that can be done in between vacuuming. Uh, if you have a, some type of velvet, it's good to make sure you have one or two of these brushes because if you start to see it crush, someone can groom it back, uh, back up so it looks fresh and then you don't have to clean it as often. Uh, pollutants can help or can actually harm the, the fabric. It, it will dull it. Um, dust is acidic, dust will do it. UV light can ugly it out and make it brittle. Uh, soot is an acid. Um, if they happen to use an open fireplace, they're gonna be getting soot on, on the furniture. They might not notice it you know, right away, but don't let two or three years worth of uh, soot show up on the furniture that's doing damage. Uh, pollen can also do it. Perspiration is a huge factor in, um, especially on these linens and cottons. You go in and next thing you know is uh, you see a yellowish haze, especially around where the neck area is or the arms, or if you're, you know, if you are in a warm climate, the, the thighs, because they're wearing shorts the, in the knee area, uh, it's gonna ugly out the piece. Uh, it's pretty, um, pretty common, especially in, in warmer clients, in the climates, it's just uh, amazing. It made me think of, I was in a client's home once and they had a leather chair that was never cleaned and you could see that, that the person always wore short sleeves, shorts, and then there was a big head mark over to the side where he must have always fell asleep in the chair. And I, I happen to say to the homeowner, I go, does your husband fall asleep all the time staring at the TV with his head to the left? And she's like, how could you tell that? And I says, it's, you can see the spot right on the chair. And um, she, you know, she realized, I was wondering where that was coming from. Uh, spot cleaning. Uh, spot cleaning is very important. Make sure they're using the right solution. Um, they just need to ask an expert. There's so much I hear that, how come my viscose or my wool was damaged? I Googled it and it told me to use vinegar and baking soda. You know, that's just gonna damage these fibers. Or, you know, I used Resolve. Well, you have to, you have to explain to the client, Resolve might be an okay spot cleaner in a commercial setting, but you know, you're not buying these fabrics at Home Depot or Lowe's. You know, you're, you're buying these in the design center. You're, you're importing these. It, it doesn't take the same solutions. Don't let them use just an off the shelf spotter. Um, and then the color fastness codes uh, from the American standards and testings of materials. Um, that's a, a thing that it's good for the client to pay attention to those, but a professional cleaner is probably gonna almost always wet clean even if it says solvent clean, because you just can't take a, a pair of work clothes and bring them to a dry cleaner and tell the dry cleaner, yeah, can you clean these, dry clean them, please. He's gonna need to wash them. And that's the same way with our, um, our fabrics. So on the codes, if when you see a W on the code, it does mean wet. When you see an S, it means use a dry solvent water-free. 
Uh, these are the ones you have to be careful that can loosen the, um, the glues on the, on the back of it. Um, you know, it, you're just using a little bit. Uh, we mostly use water. We just make sure we dry it. A lot of that's the way most of the professional cleaners will do it. Uh, they also have a code WS, which of course means wet or solvent. Uh, so that means it can use either. And then the code that you want to kind of run from, it's an X code. They don't want you to use either. All they want you to do is vacuum. So you can never wash that piece. You can only vacuum it. Um, we've washed a couple just using um, a tricky system. We would do a, a light dry cleaning and then use water followed by dry cleaning. And what would happen is the solvent would make the, the water evaporate faster. Um, but it was risky and we've only done it a, you know, in 10 years, probably 20 or 30 times. I, I try to stay away from, from X code work, but if our client has it, we, we make sure we service them. Um, okay, this here, I just wanna show a little video on the types of cleaning. And it's easier if I share it. So there's three types of cleaning. And the first one's gonna be the dry solvent cleaning that we talked about. So it's usually applied with a sprayer and it's, it's put on there. You can towel it off and it transfers onto the towel. Uh, most of the time we prefer using a it's a, a buffer and there's a white cotton towel on it. It's the best thing to do, it transfers. And you just go in the primary and, and against the primary direction. So with it and against it, you don't wanna be going in circles. You're not really, you're not polishing a car. It looks good later and you can see it. It didn't even look that dirty, but there it is. It, it pulled off soil off of that backing. Uh, the second type is shampoo cleaning. Shampoo cleaning is one of the oldest methods and we still use it today. It's the foam is going to transfer the soil into whatever we use to, to remove it. In this case, it's going to be a vacuum and we're going to try to suspend it in the foam and the foam is lighter than just putting a ton of water on it. So the piece is going to be a lot drier. This is how we would probably possibly clean something that is a dry clean only, but it needs the moisture. And so now he's just vacuuming, or in some cases we will spray an acid rinse on top of it and then vacuum that off. This chair just needed to be vacuumed. And then hot water extraction. Now we're, that shows how much water actually comes out when you're doing the hot water extraction. So that's why you can over wet. And this pillow had happened to have some pet urine that went into it. You can see the funny yellowing down there with this light. It doesn't quite show up as good on the camera, but it's all in this area along the bottom. And what we do is we take an enzyme and we just inject it into the cushion. And we then we'll spray a little bit on the surface. And like I mentioned before, for that cushion to dry, it has to wick out to the surface. So the enzyme will keep working digesting any of the bacteria that's in there, getting rid of the odor, and then to dry, it has to wick back up to the surface and then we clean it. So it's a little tedious. Some of this work is, is tough to do in someone's house because you still have to let this, this dry, but it can be, you know, it can be done. And then after it's done, then we just spray it down and we're going to we're actually going to use the hot water extraction on this method because you need to really make sure you rinse you know, the urine out of there. I mean, it's, it's, um, it goes in as a, um, it goes in and it, it's not that harmful, but what happens is bacteria will form and then it becomes very bad, dangerous to people. It'll start taking the color out of, um, out of the fabrics. I don't know if you've ever seen a urine spot and all of a sudden it'll start changing colors. That's because the urine actually went, digests the blue dye in the rug first or the upholstery that's the weakest dye is blue. That's why you see when stuff sun fades, usually the blue goes. And that is it for the, for the different types of cleaning. 
methods. Let me just get us back to there. Everyone see that okay? Okay, and um, so th there's additional factors in cleaning. We did say about the weaves and all that. So that's kind of the face design. You know, what does the design have? Does it have some needlepoint stitching? Uh, what's the backing of the material? The backings could be uh, a little bit thicker than normal and those are gonna be absorbing uh, water too. You don't wanna get too much water through the backing, but it's gonna happen sometimes. And if you're dealing with pet, odors um, or a wine spill, then, then you're stuck really getting the backing wet because you need to get the, the, the wine or the urine out of that. Uh, stitching, stitching is going to matter. Is there a lot of um, decorative stitching on the fabric? Then you can't be as aggressive. Uh, design and patterns, the, the blends of the material. What happens if you have nylon, uh, silk, viscose, and um, let's say uh, acrylic, you got a mix of semi-synthetic, synthetic and natural. Now, when you get them wet and they dry, they're gonna shrink at different rates. So you better make sure it's, it's drying fast and you don't have any shrinking issues. Um, chalk marks, did anyone, did the upholster leave chalk or, chalk or uh, what's a nightmare Sharpie, uh, you know, underneath it when they're drawing their lines and they didn't trim it off like they're supposed to? and you could have issues where that bleeds through. Um, writing on the cushions, I uh, saw a video once uh, someone sent me to ask what they could do. They, someone actually wrote the code for the cushion uh, right on it, it was a manufacturer, and then someone went in and cleaned the cushion later when it had the fabric on it, and this you know, six digit number shows up on the top. And I um, mean, it's, it's tough to, to take that out, but it's, it's, it's damaged. Uh, the cleaning kind of caused it, but the main root of it is they, they shouldn't have wrote on the cushion. It's not what you do. Uh, the fill, the type of fill that the, um, it's going to have, especially if it's um, down. Uh, now, in, in, they're starting to get away from it, but in a lot of the states, you have to have the fire uh, fireproofing done. And they do have some problems where moisture can make the cushion actually, the fabric actually start to turn a little bit of a pinkish color. And it's when moisture gets near it. If you're in a humid climate up here in the New England area, East Coast, that can happen just with humidity. If you're, you know, out in a drier climate out in, you know, LA and out that way, um, it's usually when it gets cleaned, sometimes that color comes through. You know, it looks like it's the cleaner's fault. Um, there are tricks to try to slow that down, but that's actually a problem with the fire retardant industry, um, and they're, they're trying to solve it. Uh, skirts and trims, the skirts around the sofa, the, how many pleats do they have? How long is it going to take to dry? Uh, buttons, buttons can rust. Uh, same with metal fasteners. And then, of course, the color fastness, uh, where if it's wet too long, um, the dye can actually bleed. And we'll take a look at a few of them. Uh, the picture on the left is some rust that was forming. And the reason why it's streaked is um, this, for some reason, someone cleaned this piece and then stood it on end uh, when it was drying. And the picture on the right around that corner where the fold was, they left it too wet and you can see where it browned just a little bit right in that area. Uh, beautiful dining room viscose chairs. And it was a real hot day when they delivered these and the, the mover actually grabbed, you can see his finger marks in that right one where he grabbed it and his hand was sweaty. And then on the seat, there was also a mark from where he touched it. Um, and on the left picture, you can still see the upper marks, but on the lower one, we already took it out of the seat. So that, and that was, that fabric was 100% viscose. So that is something that is fixable. Uh, same with this piece. This was an, an old antique piece. I wish I remember the name of the designer because I was shocked when, when this was shipped to me. Um, this was sold at an auction for $17,000 in just before they shipped it out to the person to receive it. They had a cleaner go in and clean it and he didn't clean the viscose properly and left all those funny lines in it. 
um, we were able to correct it, but it was just amazing that something from, um, I think it was from the 1960s, this piece, uh, it was reupholstered once, that's why it had the viscose on it, but just the style and who it's, who designed it is, is what made it so valuable. Another viscose piece, uh, right there, the spot in the middle was from where someone was sitting in their uh, shirt. Uh, their Oxford shirt was a little sweaty and they kind of crushed in the viscose. Um, that could be groomed out. And then there's enhancements you can put on the fabric that will help slow that down. Um, this didn't have it. This was a brand new piece in the, um, uh, just the moisture from the back you know, crush that fabric. And then here's an interesting one, a Tommy Bahama sofa. They actually had two of them. Um, this was right on the, right on the water. Um, we first thought it was something to do with humidity. And then we realized somebody dry cleaned this, uh, was using a solvent and the dark marks you see on the left at the bottom was actually the dye that was bleeding. And you can see how it all kind of settled down to the bottom. Um, we were able to strip that dye out of the upholstery, but it was, that was somebody dry clean that. Now, if they wet clean that, they wouldn't have had that problem at all, uh, but they just went by what the, the uh, code was. And the code was a, an S code and, you know, caused some problems following that, that code. Uh, here's a pillow that went out of shape the welting on it uh, was left too wet and there was it, the string that's in the center of that happened to be cotton and the cotton shrank. Um, I've, you never know what they put inside the center of that welting where they roll the material around. I actually opened one up one time because it kept turning black and there was old newspaper in it. So you don't know what an upholsterer puts in there. It should be, you know, either a cotton or a wool, um, a, a wool string is what it should be. And then the fabric is rolled around it. Here's an example of the Sharpie used to line out the material on both of these. And, and it was bleeding. And on the right hand side, that was actually, um, that was a headboard or a footboard, so it was a footboard. And they kept trying to go at it more and more. And there was a lot of Sharpie in there and it, they just kept spreading the ink. Um, that even something like that, they threw that footboard out, but uh, we took it just to see if it could be cleaned out. And it, it took a lot, but that can, that can be corrected. Here's a, uh, the best thing I could find for a jacquard mistake. Uh, the picture on the left is the back side of the fabric. You can see where all the colors run on the back side in, in rows. And where you see the the pink are, are really the white dots on the on the top side. They're really white and blue and, and all the other colors pulled through and it was left too wet. And the picture on the right shows where it was left too wet. So the blue on the backside started bleeding and it started drying to the front because everything has to dry to the surface. Um, and then we're getting near the end. Um, remember, use a certified professional. This is the, the organization that certifies cleaners. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, for a carpet cleaner, uh, less than uh, I think it's less than 20% actually go to a class and less than 3% actually pass a, a certifying test. And that's for, for carpets. Uh, for upholstery, it's even less than that because if the, if the person can't pass the cleaning one, which is the, for the carpets, that's the first class you usually take, then, then they're definitely not going to the upholstery one. So you have less than 3% that are out there trying to work on your creations, saying, oh yeah, I'm a professional cleaner. Let me clean your, your viscose or your mohair. Um, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. And how you can really check on that is, look and find out if they're insured. I mean, mistakes do happen. You know, make sure they're insured, make sure they're licensed, make sure they pay their taxes, they're a legitimate company. 
uh, make sure the ongoing training. Uh, to become a master cleaner with the IICRC, you have to take a whole list of uh, courses and then you also have to be certified for at least seven years. They want the experience. Um, so it's, it's very important to um, make sure they're having ongoing training. That's the certified technicians. Um, experience, what's their experience? Are they, are they out there cleaning for other people? Uh, I know, you know, people start off and they're going to be new, but you know, find out what their experience is. The company's got to have some type of experience. Inspection and pricing. Will they, are they giving you a price over the phone or are they actually coming out looking at the piece? Um, we can price a lot of stuff over the phone, but if it's very technical, I like to go out there. I like to talk to the person, see the piece. Uh, in this day and age, they can send us photos, which is beautiful. And then we research what the fabric is. So if you're asking someone, hey, could you clean my, um, uh, one of my client's sofas and sure, it's gonna be $285 and they didn't ask you for the fiber content. Um, where did you, you know, where did you purchase it? I'd be a little leery, you know, they, they need to, they, you need to ha have th that information because you could be going out and cleaning a mohair sofa versus cleaning something that they, you know, they spent five, $600 for instead of five or $6,000. It's a big difference in cleaning. Uh, references, check their references. Are they working for any other um, designers? Are they working for any other, you know, high-end stores? Are they working for Roche Bobois or uh, Lynn Rose or, or something? You know, find out who they're working for. Uh, my favorite, trade associations. Who are they, who do they belong to for trade organizations? If they're out there asking you for a referral, they better be engaged in your trade organizations. Don't make it a, don't let them make it a one way um, relationship. I mean, if, if you're in a, in a relationship uh, and, and your partner was, everything was just one way, you'd finally get rid of them. Do the same thing with your, your cleaner, make sure they're, they're out there educating themselves, educating the design industry, uh, trying to uh, benefit the trade organizations that we all belong to. You know, if not, they're, they're a little bit selfish and I, I would stay away from them. Um, and customer courtesy. Uh, use a good cleaner will, can, can take care of a lot of problems that might have happened. They can explain the crushing issues when something gets delivered and it has some crushing. And if the right technician goes out, they can really make you look like a hero. And if the wrong technician goes out, well, you know, it's, it, it could get worse. So the, the customer courtesy is so important. Uh, definitely check on that. And product safety, how safe is the product they're using? Um, you know, you don't want to, you got pets around, children, um, e even the employees that, that are applying the, the products. You know, they, they need to know how safe the product is. Uh, something for this pandemic time, we like to um, talk about what lives on the surface and you have bacteria that can live on the surface. There are enhancements that help um, help fight that, help slow down the spread of bacteria. Uh, what's interesting is MRSA can live on a piece of synthetic fabric uh, for up to three months. People don't realize that how this stuff gets transferred to your homes and your upholstery is one of the dirtiest places is we have computer bags, purses, coats. We're in Starbucks. The person that was sitting there before us might, you know, might work in a, in a septic truck. He transfers some of the bacteria onto the, onto the seat. You get it on your handbag. It goes into your car. You know, it finally gets spread into your, you know, you put your handbag or you sit on your sofa. Next thing you know is there's some type of bacteria on your sofa and it can live there an awful long time. And this shows you how fast it can grow. You know, those are hours, you know, in, in one hour, it's eight times more to 64 times, you know, all the way up to uh, 24. I mean, that number is just incredible. And I used to have a contest on who could name that for me when we do this in person. But uh, I'll just tell you, it's... Um, Four six trillion seven hundred and twenty-two quadrillion three hundred and sixty-six quadrillion four hundred eighty-two trillion eight hundred ninety-six billion 
645,213,696. Almost as big as pi. <laughs> it's almost as big as my debt. <laughs> so, you know, this stuff grows and, and the bacteria is doing damage to the creations. Um, even if this, the upholstered piece doesn't look dirty, it should get a little maintenance schedule. Uh, a right company could actually set a, you know, a yearly clean, clean and refresh schedule up or, or every, every other year, depending how much it's used. And it, it keeps the piece healthy. Um, and these handsets are great. I mean, they'll, they'll keep fabrics healthier. They'll re, re, uh, release dust and pollutants because you can vacuum them easier. They reduce the spread of uh, bacteria. We even have a, an enhancement that goes on to even hard surfaces, uh, outdoor furniture, the wicker, the, uh, the teak. Um, so, I mean, a lot of times people take their pillows in and they, they stick them in somewhere, but you know, while we're not using the outside furniture, the pigeons are landing on it, the seagulls, the squirrels are running across and the amount of bacteria that's on these pieces is just horrifying. And then we just throw cushions on them and we think they're clean and we start touching them and, and they're not. You know, we have to help prevent contamination and recontaminating it. And then we go to the questions and answers. Uh, let's take it in one minute. I want to get us out of the class. Um, so this is the bibliography and we're done with the class. So if anyone- Wonderful, Tony. So we can get the great. real stuff going now, right, Tony? Yeah, that was great <laughs> right. information. The, how do we clean viscose? <laughs> well, show us this video real quick. That's You've got a really cool here. video that you did. talk about real life stuff. Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me get back to- um, So, How's everybody doing? How are we doing? Lucy, Myra, Glenn, Oriel, a lot of people. Eric, can you see the video? I can. Okay. So this is a mercerized cotton sofa, very delicate. I mean, you can actually clean the sheen off of this. Uh, someone gave this to us. Uh, you guys are going to love this video. This is great. They were getting some new upholstery and I asked him if I could use it for a video and then I would donate it for them. And um, so we had fun with it. And what we did was um, we put a tarp under this thing, of course, and then we just started Ooh, pouring the, This is after we treated this with a um, stain enhancer. I'm sorry, enhancement. So, um, and then we did the coffee that was an iced coffee. So we got Coke, iced coffee. Everyone spills wine on it. I know after I have a little bit, um, the wine goes on that sofa. And then uh, that, that's a lot of wine on the sofa. You, you must have been pretty <laughs> drunk. I, I, I can never, I, I can never hit my mouth with the wine. And then um, we got the ziti there with the meatball and we're just scooping off the big stuff first. And I sped this up because the first part here was just a vacuum. So that is just a vacuum. Um, if this wasn't treated, it would be really into that cushion. And you can see the orange spots that are left from the tomato sauce. Um, and those are pretty much acid in there. And you can still get those out when we finally wet clean it. So here we are wet cleaning it. And we just did it fast, had to go back after the acid spots. Um, if this is just a small spill with a good protector, you can just wipe it off. But with the amount that we actually poured on there and um, I'll stop it here for one second so you can see that it's it's all coming out. Let me just let them get that water up right there. So as you can see, the orange spots are gone and then he'll just do extra vacuum strokes. So when you do hot water extraction, you are gonna really, really wet this piece. You're trying to rinse this out. You know, you want the sugars out of there, you want the sauce out of there. And I mean, it's it's looking clean. Um, so all we did when we picked this piece up is we just, it looked pretty good. So we just protected it and now we're, um, we let it dry and then we, we spilled it. This is the, um, back cushion. Um, there was a little bit on there and in a second he will 
we'll put that together. So he's just touching up the back push. And, and there's some of the horsehair brushes we use. I mean, if you weren't using a, um, a protector on this, you might as well just get rid of the sofa. But, Tony, let's of... even go deeper than that. We're using a nanotechnology enhancement on this. So you couldn't use a Scotch guard or a Maxim or something like that because that would never, I mean, in all the years that I've been cleaning upholstery, some over-the-counter product would never get that out. It would never come. Oh, it, it wouldn't. And um, some great guy once said this to me, and it made me think of it, and I use it. Um, you're not going to use a Scotch Guard on, on. I mean, I've seen forty and fifty thousand dollar sofas. You're not going to use a Scotch Guard on that. Just like you're not going to use, um, you know, you're taking your your McLaren or Bugatti to a Jiffy Lube. Remember yeah. who said that, Eric? I got that from Eric. So, and it's, it's true. You, Never you, take the Bugatti to the Jiffy Loop. It doesn't work. You, you need to make sure, like I'm, I'm tired when I'm stuck in line behind a whole bunch of those cars at Jiffy Loop. Yeah, there you go. But, <laughs> yeah, behind the McLaurin. <laughs> but the, um, so the point is make sure the correct person is doing the, the cleaning and you have the correct product on there. And it's going to relieve a lot of headaches, a lot of headaches. Well, Tony, let, let's, this is the perfect time to start talking like boots on the ground stuff, especially with Lucy's question about viscose, because, you know, you can go just for everybody who's on, who's a designer, you can even go to an industry show, like a cleaning industry show, and there'll be people with badges that say viscose with a, with a red line through it, meaning most cleaners are petrified of vis viscose. There's actually a movement where they say, you know, don't touch it. But the reality is, is that there's so much viscose in the marketplace and there's so many pieces, like Lucy said, that are so nice. That's not the answer. The answer is not, let's not clean it. The answer is what can we do to How clean it so clean? that we can yeah. use it? Right, it, it's true. You're gonna, you're gonna go and look through these design showrooms and, and you're gonna, flip those fabrics over and you're going to see a lot of codes, VI, VI, 50%, 35%, 6%. Um, it doesn't matter how much viscose it's in there. It's in there. Uh, I remember someone asking me, they're like, oh, we want to use the viscose for, I don't remember what they want to use, kids playroom or something. And they didn't want to protect it. And there was, there was 6% viscose in it. And she's like, well, it's only 6%. And I says, well, yeah, you're right. It's only 6%. But I says, how would you like to have third degree burns over 6% of your body? And she goes, oh, that is a lot. And, and she thought about it. So she, uh, I don't remember if she had it treated or uh, what happened with that conversation. But my point is, viscose is going to be in so much stuff. It's beautiful. Um, you can protect it. Uh, there's tougher styles. If, if it's a velvet and it's 100%, that's the toughest one to clean. If it's um, less than 100 or it's in a weave, it's much easier. I mean, I, I, just, I just put, I mean, I deal with this stuff all the time. And when we talk viscose, let's, let's talk tensile too. It's, it's the same thing, basically. Um, I mean, I just put a tensile rug, carpet, wall to wall, all the way up my master hallway 45 feet of it in the master bedroom and i always told myself oh i'd never put it in my house and you know what i did because i protected it i know how to take care of it um our big german shepherd runs down to you know the kid's bedroom over it um do i try to lessen it yeah we try to make the dog wear socks once in a while but um yeah, that doesn't work but, but it's still but let's talk, Tony, about the things that we can do, right, so that we can use it and feel good about it because it's just like the Bugatti thing. You don't go get a Bugatti and then not put wax on the paint job and drive it up Latigo Canyon and across Mulholland every weekend in the blazing sun and think that, you know, the paint job's not going to be affected. You're going to put something on that paint job so that the car looks good and is protected all the time. So the point with the viscose is, is that we can basically do that too, right? The, the, the answer isn't what do you do after the problem occurred? The answer is what do you do after the designer orders it and before it goes into the, the homeowner's home for installation? Definitely protect it. Protect it against stain, yeah. um, possibly bacteria. 
uh, depending how it's going to be used, uh, but definitely a, a stain protector. Um, the nanotechnology ones out there today are are just tremendous. Um, can you explain to everybody who's listening what nanotechnology really is? Because, you know, it's pretty technical. It just, to make it simple, it just works at extremely small scale. So basically, we're, we're taking a, a protector and we're going to put it on the fabric that you sourced for your great creation. And instead of it like laying a layer of a cellophane or saran wrap over it, kind of changing the feel and, and changing the look. It's so small that when it dries, these nanotechnology size, let's say particles, will interlink and kind of form into the dye sites, helping to keep the, the spot suspended a little bit to help you clean it. Uh, once you clean it or in, in you're touching it, it's, it still feels just like that shiny, soft, silky fabric that you purchased. And, and that's the importance of it. It's not gonna you know, cause a funny layer over them. They have some when you spray them, all of a sudden you, know, you can see a little bit of a film if you only sprayed part of it or, or it's, it's stiff. Yeah. Um, you know, that's because there's a, generally an alcohol base in that. Um, probably a more so if the alcohol base will just make it dry faster. Um, I would happen to say that it's, it's because of the quality of the active that's in there. Okay. It's the active that does all the work. The carrying agent just delivers it. And if it, if it has a little bit of alcohol in it, it's just to make it dry fast. Yeah. Larry, why don't we get Lucy on? Lucy had a very specific, some questioning at the beginning. If she's still in, I can't see the, who's here and who's not, but maybe we could get her on and ask some very specific questions for Tony to answer. Yes, yeah, she's there right now. She can speak I'm up. Here. Or she... Can so, you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, so what I'm understanding is not to be so scared of it, to definitely keep a, um eye on the the breakdown of the amount of viscose versus other materials, obviously keeping in mind everything you said, but is it true that treating it is just the secret sauce to all of this? Yes, that's the, that's definitely the secret. Um, and it's really the, it's really not whether it's uh, how much uh, viscose is in it. It's also the, um, you know, if it's a, if it's going to be a velvet, you, you know, you got a chenille, it, it's going to be a little bit harder. Um, right. So if it's 100% viscose in a, in a velvet, I, I would tell you, watch where you're putting it. If it's a mixture, that would feel a lot better. Or if it's in some type of, um, you'll see a lot of it in weaves now. Um, I was in a, um, I don't know if out where you are, you have a, I, don't, I won't mention names. I was in one of the design buildings and one of the designers asked me, one of the store designers asked me, goes, look at this, these two fabrics look alike. Um, and another design manufacturer copied their design. But what they did was they took the viscose out of it and replaced it with, um, I think it was acrylic. I think it was acrylic they, they replaced it with, or it might've been polypropylene or polyester. And, and they says, how are we going to sell against that? Ours has a viscose in it and theirs has, uh, doesn't have viscose. And I took a look at it and I said, very simple. I says, theirs is twice the price without the viscose. And it was a third less on the rubs. So it's going to wear out faster. For some reason, having the synthetic fiber in there versus the viscose, it lowered the, it lowered the rubs. I says, just per protect this and I says I can get guys that will clean that fabric all day long because they know how to clean it and um, so it's it's basically that and, and a, a thing that and I bet you Eric and Larry will do it um, is if you're curious if you're sourcing a fabric and you're wondering how it's going to last and how it's going to respond to treatment just take one of the swatches and mail it to them and they'll um, you know they'll they'll look at it they'll give you a little report. Um, sometimes what we do is we um, will actually make a video of um, treated, untreated, uh, cleaning it and so forth. And then we upload it and then you get a link to it. And then you're able to show your client, you know, hey, this is how it's going to react. I think this would be perfect for your dining room chairs. And it use us as a, in them as a, as a selling tool, 
mean, that's that's what the partnership's for. I have a follow-up question. Um, sure. So for the Sunbrella, AKA Rayon Reinvented, is that is that for those outdoor fabrics? I mean, do you guys recommend also treating those? The, um, uh, it's not Rayon, it's, um, it's acrylic. Oh, so it's okay. solution dyed acrylic. Um, I say treat it. The reason being is you're gonna have stuff's going to release off it better, especially if it's outdoors and pollen lands on it um, or you get bacteria on it, you can release it better and then it's going to clean up better. Um, otherwise, you're going to get mold growing on that right away. Once so much mold grows on it, I don't care if it's, um, I don't care if it's acrylic or or if it was steel for some reason, that mold stains really become permanent in there. Um, I had a store ask me to look at some umbrellas that were only like 18 months old and there was just so much black mold in there. You couldn't even use a hundred percent. Not that I tell people to use hundred percent bleach. You should never use more than a 10% solution. Um, but we just for laughs, we were putting a hundred percent on it and we couldn't remove the black uh, from the umbrellas. And that was, that was a, an acrylic. Uh, so yes, I, I would, I would treat them. Um, for something like that, outdoor furniture, it sees such an abuse. Even sometimes the seams will leak in rainstorms. And so water gets inside and mold can get on the inner cushion. I try to say your outdoor furniture, let someone clean them and retreat those every year because it's going to be a different type of um, uh, protector. It's going to be one that's for outdoors and it could possibly uh, be less money. So you're cleaning and retreating every year and, and then they, they're not having to replace these pillows on these expensive pieces, yeah. you know, every two or three years. Tony, and a follow up with that, what about you? Let's address UV protection because they're sitting, especially Southern California. I mean, they're sitting outside in the sun all day, every day. UV, not too much with the acrylic or the umbrella because the, the claim to fame for the acrylic is, um, is if it's red, it's red all the way through from yeah. one end to the other. Um, if you're using something in the home and the, and the sun's getting in and you even if you have the, well, I have the sun shield on the windows, you know, the sun shield's only working so much. You clean and retreat the fabrics that are in the sun um, every year to 18 months, and and then you're going to be saving them. Okay. Um, Wait, does that help, Lucy? Uh, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wonderful. That. Perfect. There you go. I know some people are chatting in with some questions. Do you have some other stuff there? Yeah. Um, one of the one person just sent in. Gabriel sent in a message. Um, can we treat the roll of fiber that they order? is that possible for us to treat it and get it back to them? And um, I'm pretty sure it is, but go ahead, Anthony, Tony, answer the question if you may. Yep, um, you can treat the roll, uh, especially if you're doing draperies. A lot of people don't treat their drapes. Uh, the drapes, we prefer treating the roll. It just gets shipped in, sprayed, and then we ship it off to um, whoever is the gonna be the manufacturer of the drapes. And now you're having it made and you're you're feeling safe about it if you're uh if it's for a sofa you could you could do the roll or we could do the piece um it it depends where it's being made um someone just sent a a, a big 60 yards they're having um furniture done and it's interesting they ordered it from the uk it came to us here we treated it and i looked down where they want us to deliver it and it's going to italy and I'm like, this is kind of funny. It's going back to Italy. It's going to be, you know, manufactured there, the piece. And, and then the piece is coming back to the States. And that, yeah. that piece has more miles on it than uh, I think I've ever done. <laughs> uh, there you go. More questions, okay. Larry. Is there any more? We did have another question coming in from Janice. And I'm not sure where she's from. It says, how long does the protection last? And I think she's talking about without the sun involved, because we answered the questions with the sun involved. Okay, um, protection, good protection, um, good protection uh, can last, um, we say re reapply it every three to five years. It'll last longer, but it does wear and clean off a little bit. So if, if your piece is being used a lot and you clean it once a year, I'd probably 
retreat that every three or four years. If you're not using it that often and it needs to be cleaned every, uh, I'm sorry, I said uh, three, to, three to five cleanings. So if, if it's being cleaned every year, that's three to five years. If it's being cleaned every other year, you're talking six to 10 years. So yeah. you can tell if, it's, if you're starting to see soil on it, you're overdue. You're probably doing some abrasion damage. Um, so that's, that's how it lasts. And not yeah. all, let me point out, people have to realize there's some big brand name protectors out there that are in the high end world. And when you read, every time they clean, you have to reapply. Well, if someone's paying, you know, 300, 350 to protect the sofa, and now every time you wash it, and every year they're washing it and paying, you know, 250, $300 to wash it, and then another you know, 250, 350 to, to protect it, that gets awful expensive. You want, you want a nanotechnology product that's going to last multiple cleanings. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. More questions. We, we have another question that came in from Julie that says she has sent out some viscose chairs before. So she's curious if they can be cleaned, if they get, you know, um, I'm sure you're not going to put the same type of problems that you had in the video, but if you do get wine or anything on there, what, how do you clean that? Can you clean those fibers not being protected? It's going to be a lot tougher. If it's a wine, you're, you're probably going to be cleaning that. It, it, and after you clean it, you have to put an acid on it to try to remove the wine. You have to be careful with that. Unlike wools and some of these other fibers who like to be on the acidic side, um, Viscose doesn't like to be. It likes to be neutral or a little bit uh, on the alkaline. It like, likes to be like Switzerland, keep it neutral. Um, and so that can get tricky. So if you can't get that stain completely out, uh, then you have to use um, certain types of um, special peroxide bleaches and UV lights. Um, it usually can't be done in a home because it's like, the best way to describe this, it's, it's like if someone ever went to the hairdresser and got a bad um, color job, you can't correct that in one visit because you cannot overwork that fiber or that hair. So you, you're going to be doing this peroxide bleaching with UV lights over three to five days. I'm sorry, yeah. I could fix yours in a day, Larry. I, I was going to say I had a problem last time I was working on my hair at the hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony, and you know, I want to add a little something to that too, is the the worse the problem is and the more aggressive the cleaner has to be, the, the harder that is on the fabric long term. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of stuff, what you just mentioned, the, the lifespan of that, that fabric is going to go down. Yeah, the rub. Yeah. And, and something I want to add too, just because it's protected, even if it's protected with the best nanotechnology protection out there, does not make it bulletproof. You know, it's, it's a safety thing. It's going to, I mean, it's going to give you a hundred times better chance of saving it, but you have to remember just because it's, it's protected, it can't be like, oh, just do what Tony did in the video and let's throw wine and food on it. You know, it, it's a good chance that that's going to work. Um, you know, would I, would I guarantee it? No, I mean, I, I can't because I don't know how long it's been there. So, um, I was horrified when I found out wines have both natural dyes and synthetic dyes because they have to even out the batch. So they put synthetic dye in it so it all looks even. Um, but it, we haven't, you know, we haven't come across many problems at all in, you know, in, in eight years. Yeah. And to finish up the, the q and I'd like to say that, you know, look, it's all part of a, like a, a plan. Yeah, the nanotechnology and Lux fabric protection or another high-end protectant is definitely part of that plan. But as Tony was talking about in the in the uh, in the PowerPoint, the other equa the other variable in that equation is getting a really experienced and good cleaner. And there aren't that many of them out there. So you have to find one who can actually do this work and not be hurting the fabrics because it's really easy to do. So exactly. it's, it's those two, I mean, because Lucy had said, you know, it's kind of all about the enhancement or the protectant. And that, that is true to a great degree because you're doing preventative maintenance. That's what that is, it's preventative maintenance. But then when you take 
and have that maintenance done, it needs to be done by the right person. Don't you agree with that, Tony? Yes. I mean, if I feel confident with certain cleaners around the country that if the piece wasn't protected, they're going to fix it. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a lot more work and more costly, but um, with the protectant, it's, it's going to be a lot easier. So it's really the knowledge of, of the technician that's going out there. Okay, well, I, let's wrap up the Q&A because we've got some cool presents for everybody who was nice enough to spend an hour with us. Um, you know, we have a few sponsors. Uh, I want to talk about them. Mark Malinsky at Designer Advantage was kind enough that anybody who comes on today that Designer Advantage will waive the setup fee in the first month's bookkeeping payment if they sign up by the end of November. So if you are out there looking for some accounting help with your design firm, or you're looking for some back office stuff, give those guys a call. And uh, we'll, are we sent, Larry, are we sent, I'm sorry, Larry, Larry, are you sending out this information to everybody so that they can have it and get this? Yes, yep, absolutely. So if that's a need, um, these guys are really great. They're out of Boston as well. And they're, they're working nationwide. And uh, it's an amazing company. So Tony, uh, I think Wayne has some deals too, right? Yes, he does. So yeah, if you have clients that are in the Northeast and they're moving to California or Chicago or Miami or wherever, and uh, you know, Ambassador is going to give a 50% discount off the receiving cost on the first order place. So if you do have clients in that kind of Northeast corridor, um, you can get them some deals for yourself. And, uh, and do you know how long that deal lasts, Tony? Uh, I think he said till the end of November. So that okay. if anybody needs some receiving so, done. Yeah, there you go. End of November. And then for us, we're going to give some discounts too, because you guys are nice enough to come on. So, the first thing we want to talk about is, and I, I don't want to make this some big pitch fest or whatever, but if, if you are using us, and, and just so you fully understand, Tony's been doing this a long time in, in the Boston and New York markets, and he is now partnering with Larry and I. We're just opening up Los Angeles. Once we get LA open, we're going to start hitting San Francisco as well. But, you know, one of the things that you guys will get is you'll get anywhere from 10 to 20% discount on your referrals to do whatever you want. So, you know, that can be a sizable amount of money for you as well. And Larry, I mean, uh, Tony, so how are we working that the 10 and the 20? If, um, if you just refer a protection job to us, oh, one of my clients is going to call you or the client calls us and, and says, oh, Lucy referred us. Uh, Lucy will receive a, um, a $10, I'm sorry, a 10% check of whatever the job was. Um, if it's something that you want to schedule, you're like, uh, hey, Eric, get over there to the warehouse. We want you to treat a sofa and just bill me for it. Um, then we give the designer cost plus program. We're giving you 20% off. Um, yep. Some designers pass that on to their client, but a lot of them don't because this is the added way of, of yeah, it's a making, revenue source. Yes. And it can be a good revenue source. Yeah. And then in addition to that, for coming on today, we'll give you an additional 10% referral fee off until the end of November. So that's a really, really good deal. And then here's the other thing, you know, especially in these COVID times, Larry and I built our first business in greater Los Angeles by going out and meeting people because we like people. Now, granted with COVID, that's hard, but if you would like to sit down and learn more, we can either do a Zoom call, we could come and meet you outdoors or with a mask on or anything, whatever you guys would like. We'd really like to sit down with people and, and get to know them and see how we can be of service. So um, we're open for meetings and in, in done in a safe way. <laughs> so it's a little hard right now, but uh, that's COVID. We'll mask up. We'll mask up. Okay. And, um, and then we Is have it? another cool gift for somebody today. Okay. So last thing, and then we'll let you guys go. Uh, we are going to do a raffle at the end with the emails and somebody's going to win $500 worth of spraying. Okay. So uh, you can do, as long as it's like in the greater LA area, we'll do that. If you're not in the greater LA area, and I know some of the people on aren't, but you want something we, you know, done, we can ship it to the warehouse in Boston and then we can spray everything and then it could be shipped back or something like that. Right. So, 
uh, somebody's going to win $500 and we will, we'll contact you as soon as that's ready to go It'll be in the next day or two. So, um, yeah. And I just want to thank everybody for coming on. I, I, we value your time. We hope you learned something. If you have more follow-up questions, or you, you know, that you think of later, feel free to reach out via email or phone. Uh, we just want to be a resource for you more than anything else. Um, you know, Larry and I and Tony have all built our businesses in the past based on service. And we want to serve our referral partners. We want true partnerships with people. And that's why we're out here meeting people and we're trying to help you guys build your business as well. So exactly. Larry, and it, I was just going to say, if, if, if we're not doing some type of research for you, some type of testing, uh, we didn't do our job right. I mean, that's, that's all I seem to do week after week now. And I love it. Love it. Yeah, exactly. And Larry, why don't you uh, take us out? Well, if you folks aren't successful, we're not successful. So that's what we're here to be of service to you, as Eric said. So please communicate. We hope you got a lot out of this. Tone is a wealth of information and I'm dropping the mic and I'm out. You guys have a great night. Hope you enjoyed the time. Thanks for joining us. See ya. See ya.